To find out how that process took place and what happened to the curriculum focus of people's education from the struggled years of the mid-1980s, we spoke to Andre Krak, a research director at the Human Sciences Research Council. In the period prior to 1890, we had a very radical, left-wing radical discourse shaping the notions of a changed curriculum. And the constituency that was trying to address was the working people, black people, but also poor people. It was consciously trying to address issues of poverty and inequality. You then have the rise of a very different discourse, an argument coming mainly from the trade union movement, who are now uh, being challenged to, to put forward economic, alternative economic policies. And a key component of that would be human resource development training. And they looked to world models and proposed uh, initially this notion of an integrated education training system. So in the early 90s, you have a decline in the status of people's education as a radical discourse that is inappropriate for the post-1990 period. And you have the rise of a, another discourse from another radical group, the trade union movement, which is much more reformist. Its project is to find alternative economic policies to take South Africa back successfully back into the world economy. Well, I think there are two theories on the demise of people's education since 1990. And the one theory is that people's education went into decline because it was populist, it was thin on detail, it was hot on emotive, radical content, but that it didn't really uh, give us a program of action on how to run schools in a different way. Textbooks, the training of professional teachers, school management and so forth. And that's the one theory which I personally think is the correct one. The other is a more angry view that people's education was abandoned. It was sold out by the reformism of the post-1919, especially the post-94 period. And I think that's an unfortunate view that doesn't take into account the difficulties of transition, of managing and being part of negotiated change. I don't think it's a question that they were abandoned in the same way as the first few, which saw people's education as essentially quite thin, unsubstantial, undeveloped. It had very little substance. I think the other thing that also happens, which is the more dominant view, is that the government officials begin to rely more on external expertise and less on internal and participatory expertise, and that definitely is a trend. But again, if one thinks realistically about how a government and its officials should function, that is probably a necessary exercise to get in expertise, and we're thin, we were thin then, on a lot of expertise. So you have the impact of New Zealand, Australian, later Scottish, English experts who are still working in the country in a range of areas. And our policies were, in the idea of an integrated and single system of education, were strongly shaped by the New Zealand, Australian, English, Scottish versions of that model. And in that period of about 18 months, between 94 and 96, I think there was a very noticeable shift away from the earlier, more general expressions around an integrated system of education and training, which theoretically should have actually been driven by a single department of education and training, to a program of a department of education acting on its own, looking at outcomes-based education, which was manifested in the program curriculum 2005. The more important influence is that a form of outcomes-based education was being practiced in industry in the form of competency models since 1985 and industry was very very keen on having this narrowed version of outcomes based education implemented so you had a lot of enthusiasm from business and in the era of negotiation that's a positive development you have a lot of enthusiasm now from the trade union movement and so the departmental officials I think moved with this momentum I've always been perplexed why educationalists didn't have a stronger voice and I think it's because even though many people complain about outcomes-based education as well as the system model the integrated education and training model no alternative no strongly curriculum driven alternative was ever put on the table since people's education so that it is interesting why a more curriculum driven movement did not start in 1990 in the democratic period which took further the ideas of people's education so instead of having a very strongly curriculum and a pedagogical and educationally driven response you have outcomes-based education 
So we have moved quite rapidly during the 1990s from the concern for equality in people's education through a concern for equality in the form of a system which integrates education and training to outcomes-based education.